The following webinar was delivered by Dr. Eric Dorninger, Director of Research and Development for Blue Sky CBD. We hope you enjoy this presentation of CBD 101, a practitioner's overview of cannabidiol. Come across my desk where patients share this revolution they've had in their physiological improvements. Other people say it didn't do much for me. And I tried tracking down what were they doing, what dosages were they doing. And sometimes it was a reputable company that was doing purity and potency testing and screening for uh, pesticides, et cetera. And other times it's like, my neighbor extracted this with butane and I can get as much of it as I want and everything in between. So I really wanted to start understanding why are the good cases happening? And when things aren't happening with CBD, was it just not clearly indicated? Was the dosage not correct? Was there other problems with the formula? Was there a difference in hemp versus CBD? Were they doing a THC CBD? phenomenon? Was there underlying causes like apnea or maybe a moldy building or a toxic tooth that was getting in the way of CBD manifesting its full anti-inflammatory experience? So I was hit up by uh, Blue Sky through um, one of their members, one of the company owners that I did a lot with in the laboratory business. And he said, we like the way you think about this stuff, and we want you to be our director of um, research and development. And I kind of got super excited because, like you guys, I'm totally overwhelmed. I'm totally maxed out. I'm overbooked. And getting to be a part of the Blue Sky family made me have to prioritize uh, studying CBD. So what I did is I cut back a little bit on my patient care hours so I could literally make time to see what's in the literature and then pass it over to you guys because I know how busy we all are. So I want Blue Sky um, to keep doing what they're doing and we're gonna get into what they do with purity and potency, what they do with, um, uh, there is no organic farming in hemp, we'll get into that, but what we're doing with natural farming practices, meaning no pesticides, there's no um, uh, USDA uh, organic classification yet. So when people say organic on hemp products, it's not true yet, um, but you can build a clean product and you can do it at a cost that you can push dosages so you can really um, affect change. And what you'll see tonight when we get to dosing is certain conditions need a boatload of CBD to replicate what you're seeing in the literature. And for other things, you don't need that much. And um, the price point uh, that Blue Sky offers for the quality of the product uh, you can hit some of those dosages and not break the bank. So this is CBD 101. And Stacy, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Okay, good. We'll keep rolling then. So I wanted to start tonight with just an overview of um, cannabidiol and the history of hemp cannabis. So I remember hiking uh, one of the sacred Buddhist mountains in China. And if I hike these 10,000 stairs, I'm supposed to live to 100. And um, interestingly, along the sides of the hillside were all these cannabis plants all over China. And it's totally criminalized to, to have one of these buds on you in China. But we know that the Chinese really, like a lot of things in medicine, were the first to use the cannabis seed as food uh, documented as early as 6,000 BC, so a long time ago. In 4,000 BC, the Chinese used hemp in textiles. They started realizing this fiber could be woven into clothing, sails, and stuff like that. 27, 27 BC, they started the medicinal applications of cannabis as documented in the Chinese pharmacopoeia. Sure, they were using cannabis medicinally before then, but they actually started um, journaling it. In 1400 BC, cannabis trade flows through India, the Mediterranean, Europe, like a lot of our herbs and spices, they started making their their way west. 140 AD, the Chinese surgeon Hua Tao uses it for anesthesia. So this is before the times of um, opiates, and they realized there is some medicinal value for pain from um, hemp cannabis. 800 AD, the Islamic physician Al-Razi promotes ubiquitous use of cannabis for earaches, dandruff, flatulence, epilepsy, migraines and syphilis. So again, a lot of anti-inflammatory aspects. In 1378 AD, Emir the Ottoman Empire makes the first proclamation against the ingestion of cannabis. So we get 
our first uh, kind of reefer madness moment there. And in the 1600s, the Puritans introduced cannabis to North American North America for ubiquitous use. And this is what we think of our founding fathers. And, you know, when you see George Washington and Ham on a t-shirt um, using this for textiles, rope sales, clothing, and multiple medicinal preparations sold available at the local pharmacy. So you would see cannabis and hemp products at your local pharmacy. Uh, 1798, Napoleon outlaws marijuana. Habitual use of marijuana by the lower class Egyptian inspires Napoleon's uh, prohibition. So again, it's kind of some of your uh, lower class um, marijuana is also um, follows a similar suit with some of the Latino American population and, and lower income at the time were seen as these cannabis users. And that's where we started coming up with some of this um, prejudice toward this plant. And in 1868, Egypt, the first modern society to outlaw cannabis consumption. In 1890, Turkey outlaws hashish. In 1851, the United States Pharmacopoeia has med medicinal preparations of cannabis documented. And from 1912 to 1937, you start seeing pharma kick out cannabis because phenobarbital and phenotonin result in a decreased use of medicinal cannabis because you have new answers, new drugs for pain. 1930, public sentiment shifts toward cannabis as a drug of abuse by minority and low income populations. And in 1935, pharma is struggling with what to do with cannabis because they have a lot of products in production, but they also see this public sentiment shift. So. Pharma was clearly in the business with Upjohn and Company holding 30 cannabis products in their catalog, Park Davis with 27 products, and diabetes drug giant Eli Lilly offering 23 cannabis medicines. So again, they were using hemp and, um, and even more so marijuana in their formularies. So the 1937 marijuana tax is, is a big deal. This really tries to inhibit the use of cannabis through a tax and the transfer of cannabis becomes illegal. That's medicinal and industrial exceptions only. Gets highly regulated. Regulated. There's a steep excise tax, and they introduce um, this movie, Reefer Madness, that I think we're all familiar with, originally titled Tell Your Children, and other propaganda hysteria films at the time that were used to support unsubstantiated health concerns of cannabis, despite American Medical Association testimony since the medical use of cannabis has not caused and is not causing addiction, the prevention of the drug for medicinal purposes can accomplish no good end whatsoever. And that is actually taken out of a um, uh, one of the recordings in Congress that was stated in Congress. So today, Reefer Madness, as we know, is enjoyed as a parody. And if you've never seen Reefer Madness, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't get high, um, but you might want to smoke a joint and watch it. It's a total uh, trip. Um, but, um, but basically, these people are getting high, and they start getting involved in orgies, and then they get out a gun, and they're going to shoot somebody, and like really like, wow, this is what's going to happen to your kids if they smoke weed. And... Um, you know, if my if my children do a little weed in moderation over all the stuff I've seen, me and my buddies and shenanigans with alcohol, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be relieved. So I think we all know um, you can get addicted to anything. And I do have concerns with cannabis consumption and um, arrested development. I think some of the Coloradans use um, their their vapes like a binky. Uh, every time stress comes up, they hit it, and we want to want to be able to work through life with some support from our herbal friends, but also do some processing on our own. And I think the the um, society is ripe to see this decriminalization continue on cannabis. Um, but in 1941, cannabis is removed from the U.S. Pharmacopoeia National Formulary. So in 1960s, there's a massive resurgence of cannabis use, right? Um, part of this is actually from the scientist side. 1964, Ralph McCollum and his team at Hebrew University isolate and synthesize THC. If you guys are really into the history and the science, I, I give uh, a lot of credit in my um, sourcing to uh, on the history in particular to A Road to Ananda. This is Carl Gamano. Um, who put this book together. Uh, it's a great read and it's really easy um, on, 
a lot of the stuff we're talking about tonight. It consolidates some of the literature. I mostly use it for the history part, but um, I want to give credit to um, kind of the godfather of the endocannabinoid system, um, Ralph McCollum, and uh, what they did down in Israel at Hebrew University. They're, they're continuing um, pumping out papers on uh, cannabis, both THC and CBD. So in 1970, the Controlled Substance Act makes all cannabis, hemp included, classified as a Schedule One. It's there with heroin and LSD, which is weird to me because I remember 20 years ago being at festivals and stuff and they're selling hemp. And I guess that was a Schedule One at that time. 1978, New Mexico is the first state to allow highly restricted med medicinal use of marijuana via federally approved research program. The, 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 the rules were so uptight, it was hard to even get people enrolled into that program. And in 1991, we really owe a lot to predominantly our gay male population in San Francisco, who were suffering with HIV progressing to AIDS and didn't have good medicines before the antiretroviral drugs were worked out, needing relief from things like 40 bouts of diarrhea a day, extreme exhaustion, extreme depression. And that's where a lot of the uh, MDs in San Francisco were getting locked up if they were supporting um, medicinal marijuana access for their patient population. So San Francisco passed Proposition P to help those afflicted with AIDS access to MMJ. And that was not legal. That was just a sentiment that the voters said, we don't want you arresting these doctors and we want these HIV progressive AIDS patients to have access to marijuana. But then officially in 1996, California passed Proposition 215, the Compassionate Use Act, which finally allowed doctors to use cannabis with patients and avoid state prosecution, losing your freaking license, trying to get patients some relief when we didn't have medicine for them. So in 1993, the AMA endorses removing cannabis from Schedule One status. So again, even the AMA who tends to be a little bit more on the conservative side was leaning toward um, removing um, cannabis, uh, marijuana from Schedule One. Right? It's not the same thing as uh, meth or cocaine. So we switch over to uh, the science here, 2001 to 2004, the theory of CED, clinical endocannabinoid deficiency is proposed by Dr. Ethan Russo. And if you're navigating PubMed and cannabis, you're gonna see Dr. Russo everywhere, a really esteemed uh, researcher that's publishing a lot of nice stuff for us to, to, to kind of glean, How, what do we do with this plan? So Dr. Russo's theory proposes an endocannabinoid deficiency as a link between inflammatory based conditions like migraines, fibromyalgia, and IBS. It's a very cool paper where he puts those together and uh, deficiencies in endocannabinoids being um, a common trigger for uncontrolled migraine, fibro, and, and gut. So 2004, the US allows, 2014, excuse me, this is five years ago, right? The US allows limited research and development of hemp. And finally, 2018, the Agriculture Improvement Act, uh, what we know as the Farm Bill in slang, um, declassifies dry weight, 0.3% THC cannabis or less as hemp to be regulated by the USDA. Despite the Farm Bill, the FDNC Act, the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act, and Section 351 of the Public Health Service Act still preserves the FDA's capacity to influence regulation. So the USDA got most of the pie for regulating hemp but the FDA maintains some control and we're looking for um, USDA guidelines for what we're truly allowed to do with hemp and studying it and selling it and so on and so forth by the end of 2019, but it's not out yet. So the, the farm bill really has decriminalized this and allowed us to use this in our clinics and um, patients to get access to hemp and um, uh, CBD isolates and so on and so forth, but um, but it's, it's this is new. This is a new frontier, and our patients are educating us. So tonight's really about putting a little bit more understanding in the practitioners, so we can be the guidance and leadership for our patient population. So what is the endocannabinoid system? So we know endogenous means self-made cannabinoids that are fat derived signaling molecules involved in reward, appetite, metabolism, mood, memory, circadian rhythms, and neuroprotection. We're gonna get into that one later. So your body's endocannabinoid experience results from the interacting levels of anandamide and two arachidonoglycerol with your body's endocannabinoid system. Those are the two discovered endogenous cannabinoids. We're gonna talk about a couple more. The endocannabinoid tone is the sum of 
the endocannabinoid synthesis, breakdown, and relative density of cannabinoid receptors in the brain. So just like everything else, like hormones, how many do you make, how quickly you're breaking them down, and how um, active is the receptor binding site, and how active is the receptor density for the endocannabinoids to bind. Our body makes um, endocannabinoids on demand during times of stress, emotional, physical, exercise, and joy. So if the endocannabinoid tone is inadequate, lower pain threshold, digestive disturbances, mood dysregulations, sleep disruptions can occur. So we do use a lot of CBD with um, those tough SIBO cases as we're figuring out underlying cause of um, pernicious anemia or autoimmune attack on the parietal cells or hypothyroid or why aren't their guts moving, but the whole time they feel everything so intensely. And that's a good application of CBD for upregulating the endocannabinoid system. So real quick on this, um, endogenous cannabinoids go up about 19, 20% with physical activity, and that's part of the runner's high. There's one small pilot trial on um, Acquire that we're gonna talk about later, who has a 42% uh, increase in their uh, endocannabinoids from singing in their choir group. Now, I think that's a little loaded because it was an established choir group, so they also get a high off seeing friends they relate to and connecting, but um, singing actually did better than people who exercised um, for the endocannabinoid, although exercise also came with a wonderful high. Um, and where do the endocannabinoids interact? This is what you've heard about, your CB1 and CB2 receptors layered throughout the body. CB1, our more central nervous system, testes, uterus, adipose tissue, connective tissue, skin, muscle, joint, bone, vessel, endocrine glands, endo exocrine glands, leukocytes, spleen, heart, GI tract, and liver. And McPartland also publishes a lot on um, cannabinoids. So it's another great author if you really want to dive in a little bit. And CB1 is more where anandamide and THC bind. So we all heard of women who will smoke some weed to dampen their uterine cramps. And now you're seeing why. The, the, the uterus and testes are, are, are littered with CB1 density. CB2 receptors more where um, you're going to get your some of your affect of CBD um, and more of your immune modulation, monocytes, macrophages, B cells, T cells, liver, spleen, tonsils, central nervous system, and enteric nervous system, those gut patients. Endocannabinoids are retrograde uh, neurotransmitters. So if you remember, synapse just means buttoning, and that's where you know things like serotonin will fire across bind the serotonin receptor and the concentration that you have in that synaptic cleft is how you feel enthusiastic. Retrograde means on the fatty acid uh, membrane of the neuron, the endocannabinoids actually under times of stress or joy will get released and bind on the other side of the um, synaptic cleft. So, so, so they're going reverse of what we traditionally think about with dopamine and serotonin, GABA, et cetera. So have we always known about the endocannabinoid? No. In 1930, we found um, cannabinol, not cannabidiol, not CBD, but cannabinol. And this was oxidized or aged THC. And the joke among CBD researchers with this Dr. Khan was he, ha he found some old weed. So he had some weed laying around forever and it got oxidized. And, um, and in 1943, they had some fresh weed and Dr. Adams found some THC. So can, uh, CBN is just oxidized THC. In 1964, again, Raphael Mahalam, uh at Hebrew University isolate and synthesize THC. So they're really um, able to isolate this um, uh, more hallucinogenic uh, anti-inflammatory. 1988, the cannabinoid receptor is discovered in the rat brain and that spurs the discovery of the CB1 receptor in humans in 1991. This is where, again, THC binds and nondamide binds. We'll get more into that later. 1992, the first endogenous cannabinoid is discovered, and this is a nondamide. And this is, again, um, uh, uh, McCullum and others discover a nondamide, and they name it uh, for the Sanskrit word ananda or bliss, partially responsible for that runner's high feeling. So nondamide really can make you feel wonderful and uplifted and um, refreshed. So in 1995, uh, 2 glycerol, the second endogenous cannabinoid is discovered. So are scientists interested in this age-old endocannabinoid system? Well, 
living in Colorado, I don't have to tell you all about the CBD rage, right? And the THC rage and the green rush and everything in between. But it's a big hot mess into how to apply this stuff, I think, in a very um, financially responsible, physiological responsible way. And that's what tonight's about, really getting comfortable with the research and what's out there. So in 1993, if you put endocannabinoid into um, PubMed, you saw 10 citations. Uh, today, there's in 2019, there's 9,750 papers if you put endocannabinoid into PubMed. Currently, if you put cannabidiol into PubMed, there's 2,630 papers um, on human, animal, and cell line experiments and pharmacological investigations. So people are catching on that this endocannabinoid pathway and CBD is of profound medicinal value. So a quick review, endogenous cannabinoids are self-made. The two that we know of are anandamide and 2-aragadonoglycerol. These are two cannabinoids that are broken down by fatty acid amide hydrolase, that's FA, and uh, MAGL, uh, or MAGL, and that's monoacylglycerol lipase, respectively. So FA breaks down anandamide, and um, uh, monoacylglycerol lipase breaks down the 2-aragadonoglycerol. Then there's a couple of other endogenous cannabinoids made from fats you guys know. Pulmonal ethanol, ethanolamide, ethanolamide, excuse me. Um, think of palm oil, right? Um, that's uh, the fat that we make PEA from. And this isn't phenylethylamine. The neurotransmitter does focus and attention from phenylalanine. This is a different PEA, again, a fat-derived endocannabinoid. And then oleo ethanolaldehyde. And again, that's made. Where do we know oleic acid? This is if you take a lot of olive oil and then you get uh, working out, you're going to pump out these uh, endogenous cannabinoids as well. So these are two other uh, endogenous cannabinoids people are talking about. Some of them are also being put into um, herbal products, herbal blends, anti-inflammatory blends, and I'm all for it. I think uh, Dr. Murray, Michael Murray talked a little bit about PEA recently um, and some of the formulas they're doing. So they have similar synthesis and breakdown mechanisms, but bind with TRPV1 and PPAR alpha receptors. They do not interact with the CB1 and CB2 receptors. So if you guys remember, capsaicin cream is helpful for pain. It does that through the capsaicin receptor, which is the lay term for the uh, TRPV1 receptor. And that's a way to deplete um, those nociceptors or those pain receptors to the brain. And then the PPAR alpha, you guys probably remember, fish oil also helps um, uh, manage that receptor to dampen pain. So these endogenous cannabinoids, again, all of these healthy fats that they told us to avoid in the 1980s are so essential for making a healthy cell membrane and having the fats available to create your endogenous cannabinoids. So again, if you're fat phobic, time to take off your bell bottoms and your parachute pants, get out of the 80s. And again, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but that olive oil, all those things we see in the Mediterranean diet, um, super important. This is also why sometimes people do so well with keto is they're finally getting on healthy fats again. So endocannabinoids are neuroendocrine immune modulating agents that balance physiology through affecting the CB1, CB2 receptors and other pathways throughout the body. Endocannabinoids modulate a myriad of physiological and, and, and psychological actions, including emotional responses, cognition, memory, motor behavior, feeding and energy consumption. My joke with my nurse practitioner is we have too many charts to go through. I literally take two sky gels from the blue sky and all of a sudden I'm ready to do charts again. Um, we're gonna get into why and give you that little bit of uplifting when you're not in the mood to do something and you gotta do it anyway. It can give you a little attitude shift to, to get going with stuff. So if you have too many charts to go through, pop a couple sky gels and, and get back to us on how you feel. Um, and, and, and it truly, it, it's, it's more than subtle. Um, when you're modulating your endocannabinoid, uh, go, leaving work and going and working out, another important thing to, to, to just get it going. So although exercise and dance increase the endocannabinoids, a small pilot trial showed that singing has the greatest effect um, on uh, elevating endocannabinoids of the exercise studies they did. So CBD um, is not an endogenous cannabinoid, um, but it is an endocannabinoid modulator that affects um, anandamide 
phenyl um, uh, palmitoyl ethanol aldehyde and oleyl ethanol aldehyde, the, the ones that are derived from palm and, and olive oil. CBD is a novel neuroendocrine immune modulating anti-inflammatory. It's an endocannabinoid promoter, but it is technically not a self-made cannabinoid. It's an isolate from the hemp plant. Um, hemp is, is bred to have higher levels of CBD, but could technically be isolated from marijuana as well. So um, when we wanted to make more hemp, all we did is we took marijuana plants that had low THC and we kept breeding those, interbreeding to make a hemp plant, which is basically, it's the same family, it's just getting down to 0.3% uh, THC or less. So what Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre and all the stoners of my time did is they said, let's breed out the CBD. We just want to get intoxicated. We just want to stare at the wall, right, and get effed up, right? And that's what people do when you breed out the CBD. CBD is actually very modulating to the THC effects as we're going to see. So again, um, hemp is going to be full of CBD for extraction, but you will find a little bit of CBD in, in marijuana too. So CBD is a safe alternative to many over-the-counter prescriptions and anti-inflammatories. CBD is not THC, although some CBD hemp products are contaminated with THC. We're going to get into research on that at the end. Farm Bill classifies hemp as 0.3% THC or less, legally sold as CBD in the United States and derived from hemp. I have had my own health conditions where I considered some THC. I don't really like being high. I did that uh, a ton when I was in undergrad at CU. It's not my jam anymore. THC also will trigger hypoglycemia in the more thin, lanky body type. That's the munchies, right? It's a hypoglycemic attack on the brain. Um, so a lot of the paranoia and, um, um, and anxiety that can come with THC, especially in the thin, lanky people, is they're hypoglycemic and also the CB1 receptor, which we're going to talk about. So I liked the Blue Sky um, uh, concept because we do final batch tested zero THC. So if someone doesn't want to get um, traditionally intoxicated high, if they, if they have a government job where they're getting tested and stuff like that, we have a certificate of analysis for um, final batch zero THC. Um, CBD is not intoxicating and does not get you traditionally high but it does have beneficial psychoactive effects. So I don't like people saying CBD is not psychoactive because that's not true. I'm gonna show you why. CBD does not show safety concerns um, uh, on liver more than the damning mouse paper. Again, a Southern United States paper, Arkansas. They're, they're not doing the green rush down there. Um, kidney or intestinal lining damage of NSAIDs. So again, there's always exceptions to the rule and we'll get into those, but a great novel uh, anti-inflammatory. So although studies on cell models have reported 65 distinct molecular targets of CBD, the concentrations needed to have all 65 of those work are extraordinarily high. You're not gonna give that to your patient yourself. So we're gonna boil down the, the four big ones, um, receptors, ion channels, enzymes, and transporters. So. Um, receptors, there's again, these two major CB1, CB receptors, maybe there'll be CB3 and CB4, who knows, but the CB1, um, unlike CB1 receptor agonists like THC and anandamide, CBD is an indirect antagonist of the CB1 receptor. More specifically, CBD works as a negative allosteric CB1 receptor modulator. That's a mouthful. So what we're saying is, you probably have heard that THC is contraindicated in families with bipolar and schizophrenia, and I couldn't agree more. I am not anti-marijuana. You, you know, you want to smoke a little joint, go on a hike, find yourself, you know, rethink the argument you had with your wife, whatever the deal is, fantastic medicine, knock yourself out. However, um, the CB1 receptor is already overstimulated in things like schizophrenia and bipolar, and it is an hallucinatory receptor. So if you smoke and bind THC too intensely to the CB1 receptor, you're going to get hallucinatory highs. And what CBD does is an allosteric receptor means it binds another part of the receptor and it makes it less cordial to binding THC. So <laughs> I won't mention any names, but someone on this um, 
uh, webcast tonight um, utilize this information when maybe they went to see their favorite band recently and hit a little herb and then they overdid it because it was a culture of herb at that concert and you know they thought they were in college and kept hitting it but they had some blue sky with them and they took two full uh, tinctures of CBD and they actually calmed their whoa way out their THC high down to something that was super enjoyable for the concert and this is a very hard working person I'm glad they had a good concert knock yourself out but why CBD can be an antidote for THC toxicity and getting too high is again it's an allosteric, mo allosteric modulator so it's going to bind the the CB1 receptor on the side and change so anandamide is wonderful but if you get too much ananda and too much uh, THC there you can really wake up bipolar and um, schizophrenic thought in, in folks who come from those family lines. So when I'm working with someone on THC, I don't do THC in my clinic, but um, I'll consider uh, CBD if they have to have their THC, I'll try and balance them out a little bit, but I'll actually try and talk them off THC. Or if I have a young 17 year old, uh, I'll say, hey, you got some schizophrenia and bipolar in your family. You're really not a good case for, for getting stone as hell um, in college and, and then waking up, um, this, uh, schizophrenic, uh, family line. I think it's important to teach kids about, Hey, you have a lot of alcoholism in your family. Let's be mindful of that. Go have a good time, but, but mind your P's and Q's. So we do the same with THC and, and the youngsters and they respond really well to educating. They, they don't respond well to nagging. Um, so, so it's been really fun to understand CBD as a way to, whoops, someone got too high. You can bring them down a little bit. Um, so historically intoxicating marijuana was more balanced ratio of THC. This is a joke, Snoop Dogg at all. Snoop Dogg didn't write a paper on this. Supported the breeding of higher THC marijuana, which breeds out the balancing and other medicinal effects of, of CBD. So when I was talking about looking out on the hillside of that um, sacred mountain that I hiked in China, those were very balanced THC and CBD plants. So it's like you can't get too intoxicating high off those. Um, and then we bred the hell out of um, CBD to be the chronic and just F you up and, and make you play video games and stare at a wall and, and arrest your development. So again, um, it's cool to see THC CBD combos coming back in favor as the education comes out around this. So um, sometimes people need a little escape, but they don't want to get blasted. Um, mechanisms of action. Um, so you're going to modulate that CB1 receptor, um, which is part of the reason CBD works for schizophrenia and bipolar. We'll show you that research later. Um, as a standalone medicine, CBD stimulates the serotonin 5-HT1 receptor. This is part of why it also works for migraines, right? Think Immutrex, think of our serotonin drugs for, for migraines. 5-HT1A receptor is the most ubiquitous serotonin receptor in the central nervous system is a target for several anti-anxiety and antidepressant medications. This is, again, CBD is misunderstood as this, yo, chill you out, BS. CBD is an upper. That's why I chew a couple sky gels to go through my charts. It Remember, serotonin is about enthusiasm. So 5-HT1 um, uh, activation enhances enthusiasm via improved mental acuity, decreased aggression, Increased social gregariousness, decreased impulsiveness, inhibition of drug seeking behavior, and supports libido and arousal. We're going to show you some interesting stuff on addiction later and how to apply CBD on that. But anecdotally, amongst the blue sky um, owners, we've been talking about how we all, most of us, were kind of came of an alcohol culture and, you know, a couple of drinks with buddies. All of us could take or lead alcohol now. It's really wild. And even after a hard day where I get my butt kicked and no one's getting better in practice, I'm not like craving a stiff drink. It's truly moved more toward an exclusively social or celebratory situation because I, I think my serotonin's up a little bit. We're going to show you some of the other mechanisms that help with that. So again, if, you know, alcohol and lawyers, alcohol and doctors can really be a problem because the stress levels are so high. So, so you might want to give 60 milligrams of um, the blue sky, which would be two sky gels or two thirds of a tincture, breakfast and dinner. Um, see how you feel, uh, see if your stress modulates. So um, we also see dopamine. It's a partial dopamine D2 agonist. This is totally weird because it works for schizophrenia and all of our traditional antipsychotics dampen dopamine. 
Um, but CBD went up against um, a traditional antipsychotic and did, did just as well for schizophrenia. Um, but it actually agonizes dopamine a little bit. It brings it up a little bit. So recent research suggests cannabidiol as the first apparent exception to the general rule that all antipsychotics either block or interfere with dopamine at the uh, brain dopamine receptors. Uh, other papers are suggestive of CBD's ability to deplete glutamate. So again, remember uh, the biggest part problem with bipolar and schizophrenia in a nutshell is you get glutamate toxicity and GABA deficiency. So, you know, when you're using L-theanine for um, uh, anxiety, you're blocking glutamate. So OCD, anxiety, bipolar, um, schizophrenia, these are all high glutamate, low GABA um, mood issues, and you can really modulate that with CBD. We'll show you how the schizophrenia trial was 400 milligrams to 800 milligrams of CBD a day. So again, um, Blue Sky is one of the only companies where we can even get close to affording that, that dosage for our, for our patients. And a lot of times we don't need that dosage, and I don't do a lot of schizophrenia, but I do a lot of OCD, a lot of anxiety, and we're getting there with 120 to 300 milligram of uh, CBD. So adenosine, Adenosine is what gives you the caffeine jitters um, uh, uh, by, by inhibiting adenosine one and two. CBD actually agonizes that and will actually chill out caffeine's uh, overstimulating effect. So if you're that thin, lanky body type like me who enjoys a little espresso, but then you're like, oh shoot, here come the blood sugar swings and the jitters. Um, Pairing chocolate and CBD has been wonderful for my brain. And um, a little bit of organic Isabel from Ozo, uh, one shot of espresso, little chalaca and some CBD, and I am ready to do um, people's trauma and process biochemistry and physiology and hold space for people all day. So I know uh, what we do is a calling and it's wonderful to help others, but it's also can be a burnout. So it's important that we're taking care of our brains and knowing our brain doping combo. And that's my, one of my little secrets is uh, some, some high potency chocolate with some CBD and then um, focus and empathy kind of meat. Um, glycine receptors. So glycine is specific for neuropathic pain. So it agonizes the alpha-3 glycine receptor. And then there's this orphan receptor, GPR55. Pro-inflammatory actions of neutrophils can uh, contribute to the development of various inflammatory diseases. And in addition to the endogenous cannabinoids, other phytocannabinoids and synthetic cannabinoids, CBD blocks the GPR55 receptor signaling, uh, resulting in diminishing migration of inflammatory neutrophils. So remember rubor, calor, tumor, dolor, it's hot, it's red, it's painful, it's swollen, and the chemotaxis, the attraction of all those neutrophils CBD is going to modulate that through this GPR55. Um, one of our uh, founders, Greg, has a glory story on this swollen ankle. I think it was at a Labor Day picnic. And uh, this woman took two sky gels and five minutes later said, is it possible that my foot is less swollen and her sneaker or her sandal, I can't remember, was really full. So we all have glory anecdotal stories, but it's nice to understand when patients and um, Blue Sky owners and other doctors share their stories, I can start plugging it in through the mechanism of what, what was going on there and it starts to become real. And then we start understanding dosing. So neurotransmitter reuptake. Um, CBD is showing in the research to reuptake, uh, in, inhibit uh, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, GABA, and the nonamide. So this is a powerful thing. A lot of people who do well on SNRIs, right? Serotonin and norep norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Um, consider uh, CBD. If they're on Prozac, consider CBD. If they're on Prozac or SNRIs with side effects, definitely consider with their prescriber ramping them down on their prescription and wrapping them up on the CBD. Um, we don't know about serotonin-6 syndrome yet in CBD. But remember, CBD does have a potent serotonin push on the 5-HT1. So one of the contraindications, I would say, is if you have someone on 20 milligrams of Prozac um, or, or, or higher dose, 40 milligrams, really be careful with um, if you're loading CBD too aggressively. 30 to 60 milligrams a day, fine. You start getting 60 milligrams BID. Um, I'm really going to be working with that prescriber to pull back on the um, 
uh, the Prozac, for example, while we're working with diet and lifestyle, also adding fish oil, also looking for underlying causes of depression like uh, sleep apnea, infection, tooth abscess, um, gut inflammation, food sensitivities, food allergies, all that stuff. So we're doing this all at once, but um, you really can see um, a wonderful antidepressant effect with CBD. And as always, um, try, try it with yourself, experiment with yourself. So um, ion channels, transient receptor protein channels are non-selective lignin. Lignin just means the bind channels permeable to sodium. So if you guys remember um, sodium, uh, potassium, ATPase pumps, and how much um, um, electrolytes were keeping intracellularly, um, CBD also helps modulate that. So um, these uh, channels are permeable to sodium, magnesium, and calcium. This may be why we're seeing some of the cardiac benefits that we're seeing uh, anecdotally with CBD, like hypertension, but I don't want to... Um, uh, get, in my, get ahead of myself there. Really what's showing in the literature is these TRPD1s, these transient receptor potential cations. And again, these are also known as the capsaicin receptor. So um, they deplete um, the um, uh, pain signal to the brain, just like capsaicin does, but it does it without the burning of the cream. So um, uh, qu quite a few papers have shown this. So if you're really thinking again of um, using topical capsaicin for an osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, really consider um, the oral CBD. And then Blue Sky also does the deep relief bomb. Um, this has been a blockbuster in our practice and it's not because I'm a Blue Sky guy. I, I, I am objective and if it's not working, it doesn't stay on our shelves. Um, but the... Um, Blue Sky Gel, again, has 1,000 milligrams of CBD per stick, and then it also has CBG, another analgesic phytocannabinoid in there. And we're just um, seeing all kinds of um, anecdotal um, improvements in pain and inflammation. And I think part of it is because of this TRPV1 channel. And a lot of times people who still have some kind of reefer madness um, you know, Nancy Reagan block in their brain about it's marijuana. Um, no, it's CBD. Um, they can sometimes uh, get seduced into trying the roll on and then they come back and say, wow, that was awesome. And you say, well, let's modulate um, orally as well. So meet people at where they're at with their belief systems, but um, the ion channels um, are, are also just shutting down pain, um, uh, no, uh, no susceptors to the brain. So enzymes, this is groundbreaking stuff. So we thought that CBD um, upregulates endocannabinoids, your endogenous cannabinoids, by blocking fatty acid amide hydro hydrolase. And it does have some fatty acid amide uh, blocking effect, but um, the there's new... Um, and, and we do think that's the way it works for the PEA and the OEA, but there's a new study that shows actually the way it keeps anandamide around isn't by preventing the breakdown of anandamide from FA, it actually blocks fatty acid binding proteins. So basically these fatty acid binding proteins grab the anandamide and carry it to the enzyme FA to destroy it. And uh, CBD is blocking these binding proteins to carry the nanomide. So the nanomide gets to keep floating around. Okay, so that's, and that was a really cool study if you guys later are going through the recording and you want to read this. Um, uh, really cool mechanism of action of keeping anandamide circulating around. And that's why I'm like, charts, bliss, yay, let's do it, right? Rather than, ugh, um, this job is, is, is uh, making me weak in the knees. So, um, so, and then PPARs. I think of um, Dr. Perlmutter for the person who first introduced me to PPAR gamma and fish oil and how it modulates um, the PPAR pathway. Um, cannabidiol also is doing this. One slide that I didn't get to put in here is when you give people EPA DHA fish oil, it downstreams into endogenous cannabinoids. So it's just, a, so EPA DHA has its own effect on PPARs but you're also turning fish oil into endogenous cannabinoids. So if someone's like, I don't want to do CBD, yeah, marijuana, Nancy Reagan, just say, I've been giving you fish oil for seven years, Mrs. Smith. You're, we're already pumping your endogenous cannabinoids.
patience, right? So I don't think patients realize this is part of your God-given physiology. And when you were in the Congo running around, um, getting a lot of these fats and getting a lot of movement, you're, you did not have these endocannabinoid deficiency syndromes. So um, PPARs, again, uh, what's cool about CBD is it uh, does activation of all isoforms of this PPAR enzyme, but primarily um, uh, gamma and alpha, and mediates some but not all of the analgesic neuroprotective neuronal function modulation anti-inflammatory. This is why guys like Perlmutter um, are getting into CBD because they're seeing it as a neuroprotective um, uh, medicine as well. But it's also anti-tumor, gastrointestinal, and cardiovascular modulating, um, often in conjunction with the activation of more traditional targets, um, such as modulating CB1, CB2 receptors. So again, um, uh, CBD also indirectly activates PPAR via the potentiation of anandamide, uh, palmitol ethanolaldehyde, and the uh, oleoethanolaldehyde. So uh, lots of uh, mechanisms of action. This is a great paper if you want to pull it that pulls together uh, all the different papers I just said. It's a nice summary paper. It's not all inclusive because mechanisms of action just keep coming out in the literature. And um, um, Carl Germano and some of the practitioners in Thorne call uh, CBD a promiscuous molecule. I really don't like that word. It's more of a wise modulating molecule. It's not promiscuous. It just knows the, it has the wisdom to push a lot of the levers in the right direction. Again, I don't want to over-celebrate CBD in regards to obstacles to cure. If you have a severe apnea patient, they'll get a mood lift off CBD, but they got to get oxygenated for the depression to fully clear, but um, really modulates everything right. So again, what are we seeing CBD being applied for in the literature? Basically everything. Now I wanna honor these are human trials, animal trials, and cell line trials. So um, we put a lot of the citations on um, the human cell and animal line trials, but um, really because it's modulating everything, it's an anti-inflammatory, acne is inflammation, right? It's an immune issue manifesting on the skin addiction, drug cravings, ADD, you guys can read through this list. We'll focus on some of the more specific clinical conditions. This was very interesting where CBD exerts sebostatic and anti-inflammatory effects on the sebocytes. So you know how we use clindamycin cream and antibiotics on the skin? Um, uh, CBD orally is, is doing some of that and also uh, as an anti-inflammatory. Um, our bomb, I want to tell you, has a little bit of wintergreen in there. Um, and it's a little greasy, so I don't put it on the face. I'd use more um, oral dosing. If you wanted to try, we haven't done this yet, but um, if you had a little isolated acne, you could try rubbing some of the um, pure CBD with MCT oil. That's all that's in our, our tincture, so super clean um, for uh, acne. But, but we're dosing it uh, orally. Addiction and cravings, These were there's a mixed review on addiction and cravings. So 14 addiction studies reviewed, nine were animal, five were human, and these are the big take-homes. Preclinical studies suggest that CBD may have therapeutic properties on opioid cocaine and psychostimulant addiction, and some preliminary data suggests that it may be beneficial in cannabis and tobacco addictions in humans, right? So. One of the reasons, again, is we're trying to get pe people are um, neurotransmitter seeking when they keep going back to the well for their addiction. So those uh, mechanisms of action we talked about earlier are going to say, hey, I'm okay. I feel a little enthusiastic. I feel a little cool, calm, and collected. Uh, CBD also binds the GABA-A. So um, remember alcohol, THC, uh, opioids also do some GABA-A. So, so they're going to... Um, feel a little less drawn to those drugs. In these animal and human studies, several optimistic patterns were noticed, but not all like CBD is the answer for everything, right? Uh, CBD reduces the reward facilitating effects of morphine in rat models. So they didn't, they, sh they basically shot up and didn't get the same high, almost like an abuse for alcohol. So you're like, eh. Um, so very interesting, again, rat model. During withdrawal phase, CBD appears to have no or little benefits when administered alone 
but may enhance THC's ability to decrease opioid withdrawal. And that's in the rat model. And I think Dr. Justin, uh, Dustin Sulak does an awesome job sharing. If you're really trying to get someone off opioids, it's the THC uh, CBD combo. That's a better fit there. And again, I don't do a lot of that in my practice, um, but, but then you can try and wean them off the THC if you're worried about them now getting emotionally addicted to um, escapism or, or, or intoxicating high from THC. CBD influences the relapse of opioid addiction by decreasing Q-induced drug-seeking behaviors, again, the rat models. And then CBD reduced the number of cigarettes week one of smoking cessation versus placebo. This is a human trial. Reduction in anxiety week one versus placebo. Both CBD and placebo groups show reduction in cravings. So again, they had people who quit smoking. One group uh, did CBD, the other did not. The CBD takers um, uh, didn't uh, smoke, uh, uh, go back to cigarettes as much one week after. They also didn't have anxiety, um, but both the placebo and the CBD group um, uh, showed reduction in cravings. So um, uh, now again, the placebo group is on something, right? It was fake CBD. So it gives some power to, when you're working with a cigarette smoker, you have to keep them busy and how you can say, like I use um, another formula, Bupleurum D from Golden Flower, which is for all addiction. So I, I give them four tablets, three to four times a day. I say, swallow these every time. We have to make them exercise. You know, we say, Hi, we'll, we'll keep them hydrated. We'll, we'll, we'll put them on CBD. But again, if they're doing something, um, all those are, 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 are good ideas and have biochemical effects, but, but they also just feel like they're doing something, right? Um, and, and, and cigarette smokers can be um, really vulnerable to um, needing to do something with themselves. They're, they're, you have an underlying anxiety in a lot of smokers. These are all the human trials on CBD and anxiety, <clears throat> and they're, they're profound but um, uh, they're not large scale. That's gonna be the one complaint from conventional evidence-based model. But when we look at these, a couple here, um, healthy subjects simulated public speaking induced anxiety. So they basically took these 26 people and they randomized them one, two, one, two, one, two, and one got 300 milligrams of CBD, the other got um, placebo uh, CBD. And CBD is nice because you can do a fake placebo pretty easy. Just give them some MCT oil and do a little marijuana flavoring in there. Um, and there's your placebo. Um, the CBD takers had uh, dramatic statistically significant uh, decreases in their anxiety. That's why I took uh, two sky gels before doing my uh, uh, webinar with you guys, right? So this is something you can think of. Um, and I don't tend to run anxious. I'm more prone to depression. But um, but again, when you're when you're public speaking, uh, it's a new topic. Um, practice a little bit with CBD and see if it, it just allows your brain to get focused and, and roll through stuff. The other thing I love about this study is the CBD takers had improved cognitive performance, so they were able to also deliver their public speaking message with deeper mental acuity and word finding and so on and so forth. A uh, couple others here on social anxiety disorder, but there's a case study at the bottom there, a 10 year old girl with PTSD case report. So this girl was profoundly sexually abused multiple times with absentee parenting. And what absentee parenting means in the sexual abuse world is the parents didn't know what was going on. They were not able to support the child for years of sexual abuse. And she had such severe PTSD that she had to sleep in bed with the parents at 10 years old every night. On 25 milligrams um, of CBD, she actually started having statistically significant reduction in her, um, in her anxiety and was able to sleep in her bed 90, 95% of the time. So she'd come into mom's bed, uh, dad's bed once in a while. My own 10 and 13 year olds who didn't go through this um, come to bed once in a while, right? But, but really um, something to consider in my uh, clinical experience with PTSD at any age um, and, and 25 milligrams is not that high of a dose. So I, I, I'm not g going above um, uh, 30 uh, 
milligrams in kids yet, and I don't run a massive pediatric practice, but this is something I would consider in an intense case of anxiety um, and PTSD. All right, so Alzheimer's dementia, cognitive, defun uh, cognitive function, there's two major um, mouse studies on um, knockout mice bred for Alzheimer's on facial recognition and basically wanting to socialize again. So remember, a big part of dementia Alzheimer's is I'm withdrawing and don't want to hang out anymore. And that in its own right is a problem for things like Parkinson's, right? Our, our dear friend and colleague and classmate, the Queen of Parkinson's, Lori Mishley, proved that loneliness is the number one predictor of Parkinson's progression. So a little bit of CBD is something I'll even apply in dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, just to get those people to yoga class, get them to choir, um, get them out of their shell so they don't isolate, because isolation is part of the problem. But really, really exciting times. If you were going to translate this to um, an active dementia or an active Alzheimer's or what, um, um, you know, our dear... Um, uh, end of Alzheimer's, Dale Bredesen would qualify as mild cognitive or mod moderate cognitive impairment. I'm going up to 300 milligrams of CBD a day. Now, again, I'll start at 60 milligrams and I'll go up by uh, 60 to 75 milligram intervals until we get up to that 300 milligrams. So more research on um, cannabidiol. And remember, um, the hippocampus does two major things, short-term to long-term memory and circadian rhythms. Tell your brain and tell the adrenals to get up with the sun and go down with the sun. And that's where we see atrophy on neuroquant and other brain images. And, and the first major place you get uh, dementia kicking off is hippocampal atrophy. Um, cannabidiol reverse deficits in hippocampal atrophy in a model of Alzheimer's disease. So uh, again, these are rat models, but super exciting. Um, and, and more papers are coming out. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing some clinical trials on some pure CBD isolate on uh, higher dose humans. But man, these people got nothing. Aricept sucks as a standalone drug. We all know that. Um, you know, again, screen for apnea, screen for vascularization, get the blood flow going, clean up the diet. Um, you know, when I'm, when I'm doing this stuff, we're going red as in. We're doing my good friend, uh, Dutchies Karazi, and a lot of his uh, anti-inflammatory stuff. We're um, throwing the pearl mutter in there and cleaning up the, the, the diet. Um, we're getting in on some Bill Davis wheat belly and showing them the, the dysglycemia and the type 3 diabetes. But sometimes we'll be doing all of that, and um, we're still not impressed. Things get a little better, but not exciting. CBD of all the natural medicine supplementation I've used so far as a standalone has been the most profound change in things like mood, things like pain, things like cognitive memory. And again, I love me some turmeric. I love designs for health and flammatone. And I use apex energetic serotonin and dopatone. If I only had one, it'd be CBD. Um, and I've probably have to smuggle in some EPA, DHA, fish oil, and my fat-soluble vitamins, but it, it really is doing some heavy lifting in some of these neurological cases. We run a lot of neuroquants in our practice, so I am looking to redraw neuroquant. That's, again, a brain MRI that shows atrophy earlier than a traditional radiologist can see, and we're high-dosing some of these people, and we're going to um, uh, redo some neuroquants and see if we're, we're getting anything. So stroke and cerebral perfusion, um, basically what we saw in this is if someone's on CBD when they had stroke, the stroke volume, the region of the brain that got torched is smaller. CBD isn't working as well if you're trying to load it afterwards. I still would, um, but, but don't expect like major gain. And remember, um, the two major things in the literature, if you're tracking aneurysm um, and brain aneurysm uh, on um, uh, MRI with contrast, is you got to keep their blood pressure low. That's a case where I'm actually pretty pro, as low as possible without fatigue and ED, um, and they shouldn't be on NSAIDs. The only pain management they can use out of Tylenol, Advil, and um, Aleve is Tylenol. So we're, we'll, and then we know Tylenol also um, 
obliterates the gut lining, hurts the liver and kidney. So high dose fish oil mixed with CBD is what I'm using for those folks for pain management. So again, um, if people are on CBD when they stroke, it's not going to be as damaging per the literature. All right. So um, epilepsy and seizures, this is what everyone's talking about. The improvements in seizures are not as dramatic as, as we're all seeing in our practice in the literature. And that's because the two seizures that they experimented with uh, Epidiolex, the, the um, prescription um, CBD is Dravet syndrome um, and, um, and then um, Lennox-Gestalt syndrome. These are the hardest seizures to treat. And we added CBD to the traditional uh, anti-epileptic drugs. So, so that's what actually happened in the trials. And we had some improvements, but, but it wasn't um, like the seizures cleared. We have three cases of epilepsy in kids, totally, um, um, I wanna say modulated and resolved for now, right? Because you don't wanna ever get cocky with, with seizures, but the, the kids are not having seizures on CBD alone. But I wanna honor that they were not Dravet syndrome and they were not Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. So, um, so this is where CBD and, and, and things like Charlotte's Web, which is a full hemp extract, um, can be uh, good ideas for um, part of the seizure protocol. Um, and again, I start small in kids, uh, something like five, 10 milligrams, uh, uh, 20 milligrams, and then go up to 30 milligrams. Part of that is parent comfort, um, patient history, um, and their seizure history and what drugs they failed and so on and so forth. Um, so, and then the one thing is if they are on, um, anti-seizure uh, medications, we'll talk about how you have to be careful with monitoring um, liver enzymes, kidney markers, um, when you're using just the med alone, um, let alone adding CBD to it. All right, so who thought CBD for bone and connective tissue? CBD is an anti-osteoporosis medicine. So building bone requires turning on osteoblasts and turning off osteoclasts. And um, uh, CBD does everything right. It turns off your bone destroying cells and turns on your bone building cells. All right, so here's a nice trial on depression. Uh, Cross-sectional surveyed 1,483 CBD users, 400 whom reported using CBD to achieve mood improving effects. 250 of the CBD users said CBD worked very well by itself for improving mood. Um, and there is emerging evidence for antidepressant effect of cannabidiol. It pushes 5-HT1. That alone um, is going to help with depression. Schizophrenia, many studies show promise, but there are, there's a recent clinical trial that showed 800 milligrams ramping up by 200 milligrams of uh, CBD four, uh, four times a day performed as well as traditional antipsychotic prescriptive uh, amisulpride, and that again is a dopamine antagonizing, glutamate antagonizing, but it had less side effects. So they were equally effective at controlling schizophrenic thought, auditory and, and visual hallucinations, but um, came with um, less side effects. So pretty cool. Um, CBD for cancer pain. Um, basically, what I, uh, I put out one literature review for Blue Sky, and, and, I, and I mucked up, it was late at night when I was writing, and I mucked it up. What we know is that um, THC isolate did not help cancer pain. And there's a lot of um, uh, mistakes in, the, in, in folklore, people saying CBD doesn't help pain as a standalone. And that's not true. THC isolate did not help pain. Now, it does help attitude and mood. Right, it can take you away from your cancer pain, your situation, or your mortality, all that stuff. Uh, other people can get too high and freak out about their situation, right? But THC with CBD dampen pain, and CBD is an isolate damp pain. So I really want to set the record straight. Where um, for some people, combining them two is great. Um, uh, THC is an isolate didn't do didn't do anything for for cancer pain relative to placebo. Okay, so, um, so CBD had to be added to the THC to decrease the pain, and CBD as a standalone um, works for pain. So on breast cancer, there's two breast cancer cell line studies that show CBD um, uh, induces programmed cell death in breast cancer cells. 
um, and that um, it also helped prevent metastasis in cell lines. So again, exciting stuff, but not in the human human lines yet. So, um, and then there's some research preliminary on um, gliomas, but um, it was mixed, meaning it was neutral and a little helpful. So again, um, a uh, 119 cancer patients in England were given pharmaceutical grade CBD twice daily in pulsing manner for, uh, of three days on and three days off. A clinical response happened in 92% of the cases, but only six months post CBD treatment. And then there was another study that showed adding CBD to traditional chemo um, actually can dampen that particular chemo. And that's uh, uh, timozolomide. And again, I'm not a, an oncologist, so um, apologize for my pronunciation there. So again, um, there are other uh, chemotherapeutics that look promising to add CBD to. I think of CBD as, again, from this study, a long-term anti-cancer, and then you have to um, um, use it for a long way. I would absolutely consider CBD in someone who's like, I'm not doing chemo, which uh, show up a lot in naturopath's office. So um, again, CBD also showed modulation and attenuation of endothelic nitric oxide synthase. This is um, the endothelial system that does blood flow to the brain, blood flow to the genitals, yay, blood flow to the musculoskeletal system. Remember, inducible nitric oxide synthase um, drives destruction of tissue, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, and neuronal nitric oxide synthase protect vessels in the brain and get blood flow. So as a standalone, glycine mediates nerve pain and inflammation. So CBD pushes glycine uh, receptors that also pushes um, enhanced blood flow. So uh, is CBD safe? So in general, the often described favorable safety profile of CBD in humans was confirmed and extended by the reviewed research. The majority of studies were performed for treatment of epilepsy and psychotic uh, disorders. Here, the most commonly reported side effects were tiredness, diarrhea, change of appetite and weight. In comparison with other drugs used for the treatment and medicinal conditions, CBD has a better side effect profile. This could improve patients' compliance and, and, and adherence to the treatment. So um, we, we, we don't see that much um, tiredness with um, CBD until I'm getting over 120 milligrams in a non-mood disorder patient. So think about it. Anxiety operates like this, right? Bipolar comes with this intensity. Schizophrenia comes with this intensity. That's glutamate toxicity. And you're going to need a stronger hammer to drain the glutamate reservoir and chill them out. Um, I, I don't tend anxious. Again, I tend more depressed if, if I'm going somewhere. And that's more that 60 to 120 milligram dosage. And I don't get fatigued. I actually won't take CBD, the blue sky gels, too late or the tincture too late because it actually can keep me kind of um, going kind of in a heroic academic manner when I should be resting. Right? So we want our, our, our espresso, we want our chocolate, we want our CBD to be wearing off when it's bedtime. All right, so CBD can decrease appetite. Um, I don't feel that personally, but um, if you're working with a cancer patient with cachexia, maybe add some THC CBD combos. Um, and then um, one safety adverse side effect study on kids um, using CBD for stubborn seizures at 10 to 40 milligrams per kilogram per day. That is a massive amount of CBD, by the way. Showed the following side effects. 21% tiredness, 18% anemia, 16% diarrhea, 8.2% uh, flatulence. For me, and psychomotor hyperactivity at 8.2%. Um, most of the side effects were reported as mild to moderate. But for me, some of those statistics are still pretty big. I wanna make sure you know, these were all CBD with the traditional anti-seizure medication. The anti-seizure medications alone come with many of these side effects, right? So confounders from this tolerability study are um, their kids, the neurological condition of seizures, how much does that have to do with affecting gut and, and um, loose stool and fatigue, and other meds. And then they were doing severe high dosing, dosing the equivalent of 750 milligrams to 3,000 milligrams of CBD. 
So in a 75 kilogram adult. So they're really pushing the CBD impressively um, and still a relatively reasonable uh, side effect profile. Okay, so CBD is often misunderstood as causing tiredness. We beat this to death. Um, when should we consider a hemp full spectrum extract? Because again, Blue Sky is a pure CBD company. We add um, the CBG phytocannabinoid to our bomb. I think there's a good place for hemp, and full spectrum hemp, when you're thinking more for sleep, when you're thinking more for maybe uh, seizures. There's, there's Charlotte's Web is working well for a lot of seizures, but we're also seeing good stuff with the blue sky on that. Uh, and or you just have maybe little Timmy who's super hyper um, and, uh, and you need something for helping with bed. And that's because full spectrum is gonna have terpenes that also actually do anti-anxiety in a deeper manner. They're gonna chill you out a little bit. So I think of if I want, uh, groggy is not the right word, but more sedating effect, um, I might uh, consider a full hemp extract product. When I'm looking more for what my patients usually are looking for, productivity, their fatigues, um, focus, mental acuity, that kind of stuff, I'm using a pure CBD. And I'm making sure I don't do it too close to bedtime. So um, CBD and autism is mixed because again, some of those autistic kids can get um, too revved up on CBD. And I might also consider full hemp extract and autism. I also, there's so many obstacles to cure, blood work, stool work that we're doing on autistic kids before I go to um, considering CBD or hemp extract. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's mixed. You'll get the, the Dan mom, the defeat autism now mom who comes in and hemp was amazing. And the next one, hemp aggravated my autistic. They're both right, right? So again, it's a real case by case basis. This is the study that I wrote up in the sake of time so we can get the questions. Um, the CBD trial uh, that showed liver concerns in um, uh, animals, they were um, uh, such profoundly high dosing, the small little rat. Um, we are monitoring liver enzymes to see if there's anything with this in our CBD patients with 200, 300 milligrams. We're not seeing any concerns. I'll, I'll report back when we do a CBD webinar update, but um, not seeing it. Um, uh, CBD is not for glaucoma. It actually um, is contraindicated in glaucoma and THC is indicated for glaucoma. So don't use CBD for glaucoma. 20 milligrams of CBD had no effect on intraocular pressure, but 40 milligrams caused a slight increase in intraocular pressure. So if you're using CBD with glaucoma, keep it at 20 milligrams or lower. Um, and um, CBD and, and other medications, I listed the cytochrome P450 family. The one I really want you to leave here with tonight is um, warfarin, heparin, um, and or um, what's the other one, Coumadin. All the same class of uh, vitamin K2 blockers for uh, preventing blood clots. Um, CBD and um, those meds take a similar cytochrome P450 clearance pathway family. And there's one, there's a case uh, report of one doc using CBD with warfarin and um, they actually thin the blood a little too much because the warfarin didn't clear as quickly. So it's not that you can't use CBD with warfarin, you just have to be in charge of the INRs and know that you would decrease your warfarin dosage. So again, unless you're really into um, meds and your prescribing rights and you're working with a, a prescriber in your office or something like that. Um, I'd be careful with that one. We actually refer out to my nurse practitioner or Bill Blanchett, who spoke at the uh, COAND last year for getting them onto Eloquist. What um, all those other blood thinners do is they rob Peter Bay Paul, they'll thin your blood today to calcify your arteries tomorrow because they're blocking K2, Eloquis, Perdax, so the new kids on the block don't do that. So we'll send them to a doc who does the other blood thinners um, that take a different clearance pathway. But just know that if you're on warfarin, cumin, or heparin, um, be careful with loading the CBD because you will stockpile those meds a little bit and thin the blood. All right. so. Um, uh, CBD can have profoundly helpful effects on blood pressure, blood sugar, and pain and may require decreasing your medication to the prescribing doctor. So remember, if you got someone on a ton of BP meds and CBD helps modulate their blood pressure, now they're over-medicated. 
So just be, I, I have patients with diabetes and hypertension who are on medications that were doing CBD or fish oil or vitamin D or um, cardotone from IU Sherbs, any of these products that are truly effective, I have them have a blood pressure cuff and I have them I have a glucometer. I actually get have them get the keto mojo meter. So if we ever want to watch ketones, we can as well. And I make sure that we're talking to the prescriber about dosage decreases because they're getting healthier. And it's not just from CBD in our office. They're also exercising. They're sleeping better. Sometimes we oxygenate an apnea and bring hypertension down. So, um, but just be, just be mindful of that. This stuff works. Um, and sometimes too good if you're not watching the, the other medication overrides. So um, sourcing CBD, again, Blue Sky, third party tested for purity and potency. We do a full pesticide screening profile. Very important because hemp and marijuana industry can come with some shysters and shenanigans where I'm not going to, to lose a $300,000 crop. I'm gonna spray for those aphids. Um, Blue Sky has that all available with a certificate of analysis on every single bottle. And you can talk to any of our reps about this, but there's a batch number where you can get the COL, the certificate of analysis uh, on every single bottle for, and then final batch tested THC clean, not 0.3% or less, zero THC. Um, and that's why we like bragging a little bit. Zero uh, THC independently tested. Again, third party tested for purity and potency. Grown and extracted in Colorado. Uh, as the hemp industry booms, we might source from natural farming. Again, no USDA organic certification is out yet for uh, hemp farming. But um, as of now, we're getting everything from Colorado. Um, third party tested certificate of analysis, lot number on every batch. And we're proud of that. Um, and just like the other supplement companies, I use that that's mandatory um because we don't want to help our patients feel better while we're poisoning them so a couple fun studies and then we'll get to some questions here um cbs news 52 people got sick in utah because the company was using fraudulent synthetic compound called 4ccb it wasn't even cbd and all these people were getting sick uh, they're getting skin rashes and 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 you can look at that um that post if you want to see the cbs news story um and then um, we, we wrote that all up. Um, another publication found CBD contaminated with cough syrups, fun. They found uh, 5-F-ADP, I had to look that up. Uh, dex, dextromorphin, I knew that one, uh, were found in CBD liquids and vape pens. And then a big JAMA study done by um, Penn Medicine, University of Penn, um, show that nearly 70% of all cannabidiol products sold online are either over or under labeled, causing potential and serious harm to its consumers. And again, I don't know how much trouble you're gonna get into that, um, but they analyzed 84 products from 31 companies and found that more than 42% of products were under labeled, meaning the product contained higher concentration of CBD than indicated, and another 26% were over labeled. So, um, in our sky gels, for example, the standard is 10% uh, higher or lower. So there's 30 milligram of CBD per sky gel. And in our certificate of analysis, we're usually getting to 31.2 milligrams, 30.8 milligrams. We go a little higher in that 10%, but um, it, it, we, you're expecting the companies for purity and potency to be within 10% range higher or lower, right? Um, so again, why that's so important to me is I'm tracking dosage. I'm tracking what works for what conditions and for what patients. So, um, all right, so um, we talked about this, but again, certificate of analysis on every product, the third party tested for pesticides and um, Greg, who, who uh, Carpenter, who reached out to a lot of you, he has access to all the pesticide profiles if you wanna get into that, um, zero THC and again, uh, the certificate of analysis, how you can access that on the website for each batch that we're putting on the shelves. So how should I dose Blue Sky? I've been dropping this all day, um, but what we do is we start in that 30 to 120 milligram uh, range. I'll start with um, often the Sky Gel Challenge, which I'll literally have them chew up two Sky Gels in my office. Like say, let's say they're fatigued or they're depressed, literally in my office, Chew that up. The shell is a little chewy. I, I, I say it's a, like a gummy bear, but people say, no, it's not. It's like a gel cap. So I have them chew it up. 
and literally move on with my with my intake or my report of findings. And then 10, 15 minutes later, I'll say, you feel anything? And some of the most straight-laced, objective scientist, engineer type patients will be like, is it really possible I'm feeling a little bit of a lift? And the answer is yes. So we call that the sky gel challenge and that's just having them do two. So the reason I don't start with 30 on those people is 60 milligrams is where you get an effect. And you know, patients like to come back for our services when it's working, when something real happened, when their pain is better, when their fatigue is alleviated, when their brain feels better. So again, somewhere in the 30 to 120 milligrams for elite athletes, CrossFit performance, mild depression, mild anxiety, pain, and then you're going to crank it up with things like severe OCD or schizophrenia, bipolar, um, that type of stuff. You can always go up and if you have a growing practice, great. I miss micromanaging patients. Have a 15 minute phone call two weeks later and say, how are you doing on the 60 or did you go up to the 120? Is your hip still hurting, right? We also will add things like the Agoscu pain-free exercises, Eric Goodman's foundation training, um, getting them going again. But sometimes they need a little bit of pain relief before they can even get going with yoga. So, um, and then most of our patient population is already on EPA, DHA, good healthy fats, and we've corrected the fat side of vitamins. So again, I spoke a little bit to full spectrum hemp and CBD. The, the terpenes and the other isolates, I also don't feel totally comfortable, comfortable with in a lot of my patient population because they can swing TH2, TH1 immune system. And sometimes you get that right and you don't flare an autoimmune patient, you actually dampen autoimmunity. And other times you're gonna flare that autoimmune case. CBD is like EPA, DHA, fish oil, um, fat soluble vitamins, glutathione, probiotics, short chain fatty acids. It's immune modulating for that TH3 system. But again, if you're looking for getting someone a little more sedated, um, some of the um, effects people are having with Charlotte's Web and seizures, et cetera. I, I have no problem. Just make sure it's a clean company. I feel more comfortable using the CBD isolate. Um, and that's also what most of the literature is on at this point. As we start getting more full spectrum studies, maybe we'll, we'll change our tune a little bit on that. So again, just like shopping for fish oil, you want to look for the milligrams of CBD per product. This is 3,000 milligrams of um, CBD for retail, $125. You will not find um, a cheaper per milligram uh, CBD on the market, or I haven't found it yet. Uh, a woman came in a couple weeks ago. She said, I'm taking CBD. I actually looked, it was a full um, hemp extract, and it was 3,000 milligrams of hemp extract 300 milligrams of CBD. I like that the company wrote the amount of CBD. A lot of companies don't even show you how much of that full spectrum is, is CBD. That tells me they're not getting serious about comparing the literature so you can dose properly. So, and then it's just like EPA, DHA, and how much is this fish fat, right? For the fish oil days. So I said, how much did you pay for that? And it was $52 for 3000 milligrams of hemp extract with um, uh, 300 milligrams of CBD. Fifth, that's um, one-tenth of the CBD in this tincture. So 52 times 10 is $520 for the amount of CBD that's in the blue sky. So again, one of the reasons I said, yep, I'm going to be your guy that kind of helps educate and gets practitioners up to speed on this because the value is there. And again, you start getting into someone who's responding excitingly on 300 milligrams of CBD, that's going to cost um, a couple hundred bucks uh, a month on Blue Sky, a thousand bucks on other products, right? On average, um, this would be $125 for 100 milligrams a day. That's a high CBD dose. Um, a lot of times you can keep it in the 30 to 90 range. So um, I look forward to asking or answering more of your questions on dosing, but I'm bragging about Blue Sky's uh, value here. And I just want to thank you guys for taking time out of your hard earned weeks. I know time is precious, but I know this CBD and this hemp and this THC revolution is overwhelming us all. I also want to give a lot of thanks to Dr. Justin Sulak. He's healer.com. He does great um, education on THC and CBD. And then cbdproject.org is really a great nonprofit that's 
helping keep uh, the CBD literature uh, intact. I'm here for as long as we we need me, but I know it's um, uh, uh, 726. Um, so open and available for questions. We actually did have a couple of questions. questions. One was, one, one, um, how do we connect the CD1 receptors influencing the testes and uterus, reproductive organs, and the decrease of libido with cannabis use? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we haven't seen uh, decreased use uh, in libido with THC in our clinic. And actually, we have anecdotally a lot of patients come in and say, I take a little bit of, um, of weed, a little bit of cannabis, and I actually get in the mood. It just kind of gets them out of stress and all the stuff I have to do. However, if you have someone who's smoking um, lots of cannabis, um, there are three things in our clinic that we see throw off blood sugar stabilization, and that is refined carbohydrates, alcohol, right? We, we make um, the highest sugarified fruits like grapes into champagne, right? It's sugar all. We don't make beef vodka or kale beer, right? It's, it's just sugar. And then THC all will swing blood sugar and turn on the aromatase enzyme. So you can turn testosterone into estrogen from the blood sugar swings of THC. But what I see more of the problem with the libido is in some people, the blood sugar swing results in a hypoglycemic crash. And not only you're not in the mood to make love, you're also not in the mood to clean out the garage, you're not in the mood to clear your email, you're not in the mood to go work out, et cetera, et cetera. So really watch for the hypoglycemics in, in people who are THC users. And if they're looking for just, again, a psychoactive uplift, but don't need to get that out there, um, Try them on CBD. Um, the other thing I'll say about that is if they're gonna smoke uh, intoxicating THC, they have to have a super blood sugar stabilizing meal in their gut. So, and, and when I used to party, I would say, wow, I'm going out and just getting all my carbs through alcohol and I'm gonna smoke a little weed at the concert. I'm gonna have a big buffalo burger and a pile of steamed kale and maybe a little bit of brown rice with olive oil drizzled all, the, all over it and so on and so forth. So again, you're probably dealing with a blood sugar patient. Perfect. And the only other question was, um, someone was asking if the slides would be available after the presentation. And the answer um, to that for all of you is that we did record this webinar and we will be posting it on our website. So you will be able to access it at a later date. And that's it. Just want to thank you all for joining us this evening. And thank you, Dr. Dorninger, for all of the information. Appreciate your time, gang. Thank you. Thank you.